You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. You better listen to this podcast. Before I continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, I made a big goof in the last episode intro when I tried to say what dates existed and I messed up Monday and Tuesday. But what I said still stands. Monday, December 23rd, I will be posting a live show as well as Monday, December 30th. They are not Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, but Christmas Eve Eve and New Year's Eve Eve. Regardless, I'll be with family. It'll be very busy. So I'll be posting some amazing live show stuff. I don't get why people skip live show stuff. I know other podcasts are bad about recording their live shows, but don't make me pay for the sins of other podcasts. So many people just skip the live show episodes. And if you do, you're wrong. They're very good. They're very fun. And we have people on the case that make the audio very solid. So if you're skipping these, you're missing out. So check them out. They're going to be very good. I'll be posting audio from the Boston live show and the Houston live show. They're both incredibly fun. Barb and Joel were at the Houston live show. They said it was great. So I don't I don't know what's out to love. You got to check it out. Right, Barb and Joel? Yes, yes it, it was, was great. great. Exactly. So stay tuned for that. And then right in the new year, we will get it started with movie six episodes. Also, it's mid-December, and if you're anything like me, you haven't done most of your Christmas shopping. If you're panicking to figure out what to get your beloveds, why don't you get them some merch? You can get Potterless merch and all other sorts of Multitude merch over at multitude.production slash merch. We have a bunch of stuff. It's all in stock. Pins, posters, shirts, hats, whatever you need. Get it and get it soon so it can come in time for the holidays and you will win the gift giving of whatever holiday it is because we all know it's a competition. Speaking of competition, these people are winning the competition for my heart. And yes, that's our new patrons. So shout out to Anna Grace Colley, Madison Flat, Olivia, Martin Vander Westwiesen, and Lou Zanardi. And a huge shout out to our new producer level patrons, Victoria Kolka Perry and Joe Radwan. They join the ranks of Vicky Aaron, Jesse Cloud, Frank Marchismo, Samantha Juan, Rose Marie, Marie, Lisa Romina, Audra Eleanor, Ross Ann, Nikita, Ali, Amelia, Sarah Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Moster, Ingen, Alex, John, Noel, Emily, Liz, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Rory, Gloria, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Ivor, Naomi, Summer, Andrea, Lynn, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Uthas, Maya, Mark, Polly, Netter, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Addie, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Sabrina, Alicia, Kafir, Lindy, Sarah, Martin, Aaron, Eileen, Violet, Lindsay, Keegan, Miranda, Gale, Mr. Folk, Maya, Kieran, Lily, Wire Warrior, Floor, Siri, Georgia, Peter, Skyla, Adele, Professor Threat, Kelsey, Lubin, Malaya, Lena, Daniel, Lily, 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 Elizabeth, Michael, Tiffany, Kelly, Carrie, Jamie, Connie, Mary, Anastasia, Jaden, Nedry, Matt, Riley, Will, Zephyr, Brett, Samantha, Kayla, Aurora, Emma, Out of Context, Marcos, Hannah, Courtney, Victoria, Marie, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, Julie, The Meadows Family, Jennifer, Anna, Fake, Brianna, Karu, Teru, Sarah, McKenna, Six Awkward Nine, Anthony, Peter, Heather, Dead Cat, Lady Javi, Darlene, Brad, Thomas, Charlotte, Brianna, Kevin, Lori, Patrick, Chrissy, Alex, Bugaboo, Jarl, Haley, Emma, Ashley, Peter, Sophie, Jack, Jan, and T Pixel Guy, Nicole, Out of Context, Callahan, Kylo, Leah, Melissa, Jordy Wright, Bella Barlack, Melanie, Demi, Bill, Gill, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never try to walk through a subway turnstile without swiping their card, making a very loud bang noise as they walk into the metal bar. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to exclusive bonus episodes, director's commentary, my notes, live streams, you can head on over to patreon.com slash potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 106, the third of three parts about the fifth movie, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, guest starring Daniel Kinnaman and Jakiva Phillips. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man who didn't read the Harry Potter books as a kid. Now he read them as an adult. Now he's doing the movies and talking about it with people. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm that grown man, and I'm here joined by some lovely improvisers from my days in Seattle. It is Daniel Kinnaman and Jakiva Phillips. Daniel and Jakiva, how's it going? Good. Good. Jinx, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, Jakiva Phillips, Jakiva Phillips, Jakiva Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you owe me a Coke. No, you owe me a Coke. <laughs> punch buggy, no punch back. <laughs> Doorknob. Shotgun, safety. <laughs> 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 Just made me gun parts now. Well, shotguns are like calling front seat, and then safety is when you fart. Come yeah, on, yeah. all of the things. Wait, safety is when you fart? Yeah, so if you it's, fart. It's the preemptive to doorknob. <laughs> if you fart, someone else can say doorknob, and they get to punch you until you touch a doorknob or a doorbell. <laughs> Now, now you can get in front of this by saying safety when you fart. So even if you fart silently, you still want to announce to the room safety just to cover your bases. Isn't America amazing? <laughs> Land of the free. I think this is the America of nine-year-old boys. <laughs> 
part, but you have to say safety. Every European listener is just, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. All of Finland is like, who is this? How they are. Uh, unsubscribe. <laughs> no, Finland. <laughs> I want to do my live show in Finland so badly. So let's get right back into it. We have a decent amount of movie to discuss. Oh, and boy, do It we. is late here in New York, and I want to get this done. <laughs> <laughs> but first thing from where I've left off, I just have a note when there's the snake attack that Harry sees in his dream and he runs to Dumbledore's office. You see our first instance of Phineas Nigellus Black, who I think is a wonderful character, and he looks great. His outfit is phenomenal. Uh-huh. So glad that Phineas is living up to my very high expectations that I imagined for him when reading the books. I uh, was taking notes with one hand and eating a spaghetti squash with the other. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, he in my mind's eye, he just looks like an empty painting because I looked up after he left to relay the message. So I missed out. Oh, no, he was there. He had a funny hat, cool robes, looked fantastic. Mm. Good beard going on. Later on, we see scenes where the Voldemort dark mark tattoo is coming back for some of his followers. And uh, Bellatrix licks her tattoo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sp- <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's just, she's just being Bellatrix, I guess. She's weird. She's Helena Bottom Carter. Ah, creepy. I'm licking my forearm. Yeah. I mean, how do you think she spends her free time? How does Bellatrix unwind? <laughs> she's still a creep. I don't think she ever does. <laughs> she, like, that's stop. the secret to being Bellatrix. Stop licking things. We're at a quiz nose. <laughs> <laughs> she's just behind the counter, like, licking the meats. <laughs> you can't be back there. That's my whole But cold everything's violation. so. Mm, 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 toasty. Yeah, she's a bit much. Are Quiznos is still around? Yeah, no, Quiznos is still around. Quiznos is still around. They're the ones that toast the sandwich, right? Yes, they are the ones that are mm, 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 toasty. <laughs> yeah. and which one's silly name, serious sandwich? Oh, I don't know. I've never heard of that. I can't remember. Yeah. Right yeah. on in, folks. Hey, editing mic here. That would be Schlotsky's Deli, whose slogan for a little bit was funny name, serious sandwich. Anyway, back to the podcast. Oh, man. Quiznos, what a time. <laughs> I do like Quiznos, and it makes me mad that Subway won the Sandwich Wars. Yeah, well, it was a Pyrrhic victory. <laughs> they both lost. Those aren't food. Subway doesn't make food. I've always said that Subway is just hunger deletion. When you eat something from Subway, it's like when you're a Sims character, and you have a hunger quotient, and it's red and flashing, and you need to get it back to green, so you eat a Subway sandwich, and you just become not hungry anymore. Okay, mm. then, then who won the sandwich war? Don't say Jimmy John's, because uh, I will personally fly to New York and slap you in your face. No, I mean, in New York, you just go to a deli and you just get a good sandwich. Oh, Jersey Mike's. Right. <laughs> <Ugh, dude. laughs> You're lucky I'm in your home. I've been to the original Jersey Mike's, oh. and it's just called Mike's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Same font and everything. It just has mics. It's good. They may, they actually make good subs at that one because it's in New mm-hmm. Jersey where subs, hoagies, whatever you call them, are good. Yeah. Whereas over here, we get the lettuce that is like somehow white. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, Mike, I feel like since you moved to New York, you got really bougie about your sandwiches. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> you were not you were not this person like two years ago. The, uh, the bread is just good here. Like the bread products are solid. Wow. Bagels are amazing. Yeah, wow. the air is suck. sweeter. The streets paved with cheese. It's a wonderful place. <laughs> <laughs> the rats are eating all that cheese. <laughs> They're immigrating from other countries <laughs> to do so. <laughs> the one thing from Seattle to New York that I have not learned yet, and I need to, is that in Seattle it rains a lot, but it's always this drizzly misty type of rain so all you need is a waterproof jacket with a hood mm-hmm. and in new york i think that works even though it doesn't because it really rains here <laughs> so i just never bring an umbrella everywhere if i know that it's gonna rain i just pack my rain jacket and then my legs are drenched <laughs> <laughs> but your hair yeah. stays glorious and that's what matters that yeah. is really in what seattle matters. if you are seen with an umbrella you are made fun of oh. by every car passing yeah by. which okay so that is true but also so, like, I feel like the rains have gotten worse here over the years as somebody who's lived here most of my life. So it's like sometimes you really do just need an umbrella. It's true, but tradition is tradition. <laughs> also, like, my hair's really, I, I can't, it's because it's in a big bun. Mm. So I can't always put a hoodie over it, but I can't put an umbrella over it. I don't know. You've made your choice. <laughs> All right, fine. I'll just have dowdy hair like the rest of Seattle. <laughs> anyway, all right. Harry so. Potter, Harry Potter. Anyway, Harry Potter. 
Seamus apologizes to Harry for not believing him because now he does now with all of the things that are happening. Plot thread resolved. Mm-hmm. But did anyone else notice how bonkers Seamus' tie was in this scene? <laughs> no. <laughs> what no. was it? It is tied the shortest I've ever seen a tie tied. It does not go past his second button. It looks like it must be a stylistic <laughs> choice, but it looks ridiculous. Ridiculous. That's the tie of shame. <laughs> I'm sorry, Harry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then there is a Dumbledore's army scene where Harry is teaching them Expecto Patronum, which is very fun. And I think it's a really good scene. We get some good stuff where Luna has her rabbit and Ginny has her horse and Hermione's got her otter and Ron's got the Jack Russell Terrier. There's all sorts of good stuff happening. I really enjoyed the scene. And then this is something that happens that is different from the books to the movies is when... The Inquisitorial Squad and Umbridge break in and find them in the Room of Requirement. Oh, so, yeah. as we mentioned in the last episode, in the books, what happens is that Marietta Edgecombe snitches on them and then they come through and bust in on them in the act. Dobby at some point comes through before it happens and warns them that. Umbridge is coming, so the kids try to scatter, and then there's a chase down the hallway. I think it was much better laid out in the book. In the movie, it just kind of doesn't make sense. They poke a hole in the wall with a battering ram, yeah. and then Umbridge does Bombarda Maxima, which is not a spell that exists in the books. It's yeah. uh, I, This really rubbed me the wrong way. It just felt less... I don't know, when it happens in the book, it feels so much more sudden and more dramatic. And, oh, no, someone ratted us out. Ah, they're on their way. We got to get out of here. And uh, it just, I really didn't like how they did it in the movie. Yeah, it's just, it's another one of those. And it happened. Yeah, Yeah. I find it interesting also, like, what was the point of changing it? You know, like, it wasn't a dramatically better version. It wasn't better storytelling. So what was the point of doing that? Yeah, I guess it's because they got rid of Two characters that are essential to that, Marietta and Dobby, just aren't in the movie. So when those are the two linchpins of the way that the scene breaks down, I guess they got to change it. I guess. But you know what I thought for a split second? Like after Seamus apologized, I was like, ooh, homeboy's lying. He's full of shit and he's going to do some stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, that could have been an easy fix. I don't know. Like if you're going to cut characters out, then maybe you can change some character motivations. And then Seamus is the one who's all horribly scarred for life. Did you guys see that the bad guy inquisitorial squad had Cho with them and she was crying. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she narked and <laughs> is never seen again. But they later reveal it was because of Veritaserum. Oh. Uh, it still. was because of what? Veritaserum. It is a truth serum oh, in the yeah, wizarding yeah, yeah, world yeah, that yes, makes yes, you yes, tell yes, the yes, truth. Yes, yes. Still, you've been dumped by Harry Potter for narking. Right? <laughs> I, I dump her. I dump her for those bangs, though, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not not super great. So then we get into the scene where you've got Fudge and Percy finally shows up for the first time in the movies. And they're in Dumbledore's office and they're getting rid of him for allowing Dumbledore's army. Dumbledore takes the fall, saying that it's he who came up with it. And they change a little bit between book and movie here. In book, there's a more drawn-out fight between the other sides and Dumbledore. I think there's also something where he like kind of pauses time for a little oh. bit. I don't know if he pauses time or like does some sort of explode or he freezes them in place and then tells Harry what's up and then he disappears and then they freeze back. I think that's he does something like that. Huh. It was also facilitated by Kingsley and the other person whose name is escaping me. Dollish? Yes, there it is. Kingsley and Dollish are on Dumbledore's side, so they help facilitate it. Dollish, by the way, in this scene is dressed like a flasher. <laughs> 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 he's wearing his freaky tan overcoat and like, I don't, I don't trust this guy. Also, he's a wizard. What's going on? A sexy wizard. Uh, but the one thing that is incredibly well done in the film is the overhead fox clap. Oh, yeah. That I love that. Dumbledore does to. Oh, yeah. man. Dumbledore uses his standard action to cast the skill Phoenix clap. <laughs> <laughs> Stuns everyone in the room for two turns while he uh, teleports somewhere else. Yeah, he rolled a d20 on that one, for sure. (laughs) And then I love that they cut to Kingsley Shacklebolt and he goes, say what you want, Dumbledore's got style. (laughs) (laughs) 
aren't you supposed to be arresting him? Yeah. <laughs> Kingsley. But Kingsley's Dumbledore's friend. Yeah. yeah. That was one of those like obligatory like lines where I was just like, oh, sure, of course. It's, <laughs> it's like when you watch like an action movie from like, the 80s and you're like, oh, okay, this is the line that like clearly you mm. have to deliver at this moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. But no, I absolutely love that part. That was one of the things that's like, yes, Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. very good. So then, yeah, there's a whole combination of things that were changed, like Cho being the snitch. And then I don't think everybody uses the scar pen. I think that's something they added in the movie with everyone getting the I must not tell lies thing on their hands. And then there's just something when they're talking about all the different decrees that Umbridge has instituted. She says boys and girls cannot be within eight inches of each other, Mm -hmm. which feels weird and counterproductive. But then also, as we've seen throughout this movie in Umbridge's classroom, there are desks where it's two to a desk. Uh. So... I don't just they have to not sit boy girl next to each other or far away I don't know I, that just stood out I was like what are we doing here one cheek on the outside of each chair <laughs> oh, yep that's it this is the montage that is like you know Umbridge has won she's taken over the school this is how she envisioned it and part of it is Filch taking a painting off the wall and shaking all the people in it out yeah, of it yeah well it's bonkers I don't know the montages in this movie are not no, my favorite no. not doing it a whole lot for me so we have a scene of the squad being grumpy on the walkway outdoors and where everyone's always moody. Anytime people are moody, they're on this extended walkway outside the yeah. school. And then you just get this great thing where Hagrid trying to be sneaky, which I love because he's a half giant, kind of pokes his head around and goes, Psst, and then they go with Hagrid yeah. <laughs> when he shows them grop. Oh, I think it's so fantastic. <laughs> and then you have the whole grop scene and, this isn't in the book where Grop gives Hermione a detached handlebar from a bicycle as a gift. Yeah. And then rings the bell. What the frig are bicycle handlebars doing in the magic forest or the forbidden forest? I don't know. <laughs> so strange. Hey, I, I don't know. This is my take. If you're going to cut anything from this movie, cut Grop. <laughs> we don't need Grop. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you need Grop? I guess so that you knew what he was in movie seven. Yeah. Does he have a bigger part later on? Not that big. Okay. If Grop wasn't in any of the movies, I don't think anyone would be upset. Okay. He's a very minor role in the sixth movie at the end in the funeral scene, but they don't even put that in the sixth movie. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, he fights some of the Death Eaters and the Giants in the seventh movie. Hey, Editing Mike here, real quick. I meant movie eight, not movie seven. Very often I will call movie eight movie seven because my brain goes, ah, it's the movie about the seventh book. Thus, it's movie seven. So yeah, in movie eight, Grop is there and fighting, but still, he's not that big of a deal. So did we really need Grop? I don't think we need a Grop. He's like a little unpleasant. He's like grabbing people. He's not computer animated great. No, he's not. That was one of those things that was uh, like not to like poo poo the CGI, yeah. but it was 2007. But like him and like the letter when Harry Potter gets expelled, I was oh, like, ooh, yeah. these graphics are great. Yeah. Yeah. The thing with Grop is that in the book, it makes more sense because it's more drawn out. It's more of a thing. You see him more than once. And also there's a scene, a fun thing. There's just no Quidditch in this movie, which me as an opponent of Quidditch, I love. But you there's a couple like important plot points that happen Quidditch related in this one. Isn't this like a big Ron Quidditch book? Yeah. Ron joins the Quidditch team and that's a whole thing. You get Fred and George beating up Malfoy because he talks shit about Molly Weasley and then they get expelled from playing Quidditch and then Quidditch counts as a club so then they can't play Quidditch when Umbridge wants to get rid of organizations. Quidditch actually has a big role. I also, I'm not sure, I think it's this movie when it's either the fifth or the sixth book where Ginny flies into the announcer's table because Zachariah Smith is being annoying (laughs) and then McGonagall lets her get away with it because it's funny. So there's just no Quidditch, which I think is fine, but then there's a lot of associated plot points that just get nixed as well. There's a very good transition that I think is very clever here is you have Hagrid at the end of this grow up scene saying, I'm the only family he's got. And then it cuts to Harry looking longingly at his parents in the mirror of the Erised. Yeah. But then Snape's in the background and then it transitions to a Snape Harry lesson. I thought that was awesome. Yeah. I really liked that. They took advantage of like the thing that you can do with these movies, which is like show everyone as kids and instantly tug on heartstrings. Yeah. <laughs> So they do this scene between Harry and Snape, which 
kind of hybrids and changes things the way they were done in the book. In the book, Harry has this flashback thing about Snape by using the pensive and Harry does this thing where he uses a protective charm and gets to see inside of Snape's mind, but he doesn't see this bad memory. He sees Snape being sad and having a bad life at home situation. Mm. And then later on in the books, when Harry goes into the pensive in Snape's office when he's not there, that's when Harry sees the whole James Potter versus Snape and Snape being mean to Lily and all of this stuff. So I was disappointed that that was reduced because I think that's an important plot point. It's the first time you really see, oh, maybe this is why Snape is such a curmudgeon kind of thing. And oh, maybe this is why Snape hates James Potter so much. And I think they really watered it down. Yeah, I agree. I feel like the Snape's bad home life is an important part of that equation because if you took, if if you took a, like a scene where is Malfoy like getting suspended in the air or turned into a ferret or whatever, you're you're, you're like, good. Yeah. You have to learn that that's a sympathetic character to care more mm-hmm. and with Snape it's kind of like I don't know maybe he said something racist <laughs> I will say it is strange <laughs> that James specifically says who wants to see me take off Snively's trousers mm. <laughs> which this is a big point of debate in the books is that when they flip Snape upside down he, you can see his underwear and then it's a question of A do wizards not wear pants or B do wizards wear pants and Snape is weird for not wearing pants but then the point that is made fun is that his underwear is very dirty oh. but since it's been established in the movies that they just wear clothes whenever I guess and robes sometimes maybe when they're in class but they also never go to class anymore then it becomes weirder because James has to say who wants to see me take off his pants which is a weird bullying like, what are you, like <laughs> come on dude that's not fun that's gross <laughs> also that's that's like so much logic and universal reasoning applied by the screenwriters of this film to that one line for like mm-hmm. well the world of wizarding pants is more complex than we thought it was <laughs> so we better <laughs> clarify this so You then have a scene with Fred and George consoling some character named Michael about the scar hand. Mm -hmm. And this is where they've taken Fred and George, one of their best quotes from a different point in the book and put it earlier. In the book, it's we've outgrown full time education. Mm. But in the movie, they change it a little bit to something that's not as good. And in the movie, they say this before they do their big thing where they ride and do fireworks and leave. Whereas in the book they do this and then they say that amazing quote just before they zoom off into the sky Uh, and that made me real upset this is one of those changes of why are you doing it this way why is the source material not good enough what about this was uh, no 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 we must change this why david (laughs) i I, I think in that one this might be one of the only ones where I, i think it kind of makes sense because they're trying to set up the reason why they're about to do what they're about to do oh okay okay that's the last straw kind of thing. Yeah. for And again, like thinking about like, this is something that we are, as adults love it. But like if you were 12 years old, having it the setup before like them going off and setting off all the fireworks is probably easier for you to understand than it happening while the fireworks are going off. I guess I could see it still happening this way. I'm just mad that they took what I think is such a great quote and changed it and changed when it happens. I feel like you could do the same scene where they're consoling this kid and then they say something else. And then when they're doing the fireworks and leaving, they get to deliver the, hey, Fred, I think we've outgrown full-time education Mm -hmm. and then fly off into the sky. I just think having that cool quote just before they zoom off into the sunset is dope. Yeah. And they got rid of it. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Uh, This this was one of my favorite Harry Potter books. (laughs) Yeah. I was sad, but then they cut to Flitwick doing a fist pump, and I felt a lot better because he looked very happy, and it was good. (laughs) Flitwick's revenge. (laughs) So then later on, we've got the scene where Umbridge is freaking out about what's going on, and she's got Harry in there. She slaps Harry in the face, which I don't remember happening in the books. (laughs) Uh, Then this is the reveal of using the Veritas serum on show, Snape comes in. I think they keep this pretty true to the essence of how the scene is in the book. They change little things here and there with how Snape did it with the Veritas serum and all that kind of stuff. But I think it still gets it along pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I did really appreciate that 
before Umbridge says that she's going to use the Cruciatus curse on Harry, she puts down the picture of Cornelius Fudge from her desk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like, this That's is too detail. terrible even for you to watch. <laughs> Don't look at this. You can't see this. <laughs> but then Hermione does the thing where she has the improvised plan. She's a bit more competent in the movie because in the book it was kind of like she just blurts it out and then has no idea what to do. And then Harry has the idea to get him in and they do the centaur thing, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Then again, this whole interaction with Umbridge and the centaurs and Grop coming in is different. Only Umbridge gets attacked by the centaurs, even though they all were attacked by the centaurs in the book. And then she doesn't ever admit to sending the Dementors, which I think is actually really important. I was I thought that was a really big reveal in the the book. Yeah. Yes. That's supposed to be an earth shattering reveal in the book is that you always got this. A big question was, did the Ministry send them or did Voldemort send them? Because in the trial, Dumbledore talks about two different things. He talks about, well, either the Ministry sent it and that's some shit, or Voldemort sent them and that's also some shit. He raises both possibilities. Mm -hmm. So the whole time you're reading the book, you don't know what it is. Both are bad. But then Umbridge reveals that she sent them herself. And that's huge. And to not put that in the movie, to me, makes no sense at all. I don't understand why you would get rid of that. So why did she send the Dementors? What's her reasoning in the book? The whole thing is to set up this trial. You send the Dementors so that Harry has to use the spell so that you can get him expelled from the school and put him on trial. It's a whole thing. She kicks the whole beginning of the book into play Mm. by putting him in a situation where he is forced to use magic outside of school so then they can arrest him or whatever and bring him into trial, etc. Mm. Okay, makes sense. Uh, I thought that whole thing where she gets dragged off, I was, again, that was like a kind of moment where I was like, ooh, but I did, I totally wanted her to just get owned. Like, maybe this is just dark Jakiva coming up and I was like, can we eviscerate people in this movie? <laughs> and I was like, probably not, but that's the, that's kind of what I wanted. But yeah, if, if we don't get like the reveal that she was the one who did it, like that would be like such a big moment in that film. And to not have it in there is like a diss to like the book. It's huge. I remember reading the book and freaking out. I bet they shot that scene and just took it out. <laughs> it didn't That's, fit. Oh yeah, that also sucks though. It's like yeah. why even? I don't know. Some of the things that end up on the cutting room floor sometimes are just like wrong. Yeah. Sorry, J.K. I'm going against the original text here. I wanted to see her get you know, uh, like uh, revenged upon by the children of the school, not a bunch of centaurs that they bump into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like, she tormented those kids so they should have revenge. But then also, then that's, like, not the kids of Hogwarts. Yeah, that's true. Because, I mean, Harry couldn't even kill freaking the one person who, like, murdered his god. Anyway, I'm yeah. sorry. We'll get to that in a minute. We'll mm-hmm. get to that in a minute. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, oh, good line here, though. Good burn by Harry. Umbridge s- says to the centaurs, oh, yeah. tell them I mean no harm. And Harry says, I'm sorry, Professor. I must not tell lies. Boom! <laughs> it's yeah, really I good. Remember that. I yeah. don't remember if that was in the book or not, but that line's really freaking yeah, good. That was a good one. So then Harry, the squad, Neville, Luna, and Ginny are going to London. And the way they're going to get there is by taking Thestrals. And Here's something that continuity-wise doesn't make any sense. In the books, you get a fun thing because the way Thestrals work, if you've seen death, you can see them. And if you have not witnessed death, you can't see them. Uh When this scene happens in the books, half of the people can see Thestrals, and then the other half just can't see what they're flying on. (laughs) Yeah. That's cool. And it's very fun, and they just don't do that. Also, weirdly, Neville in the books can see Thestrals, but in the movies, he can't. Hmm. Again, why have we changed this? Yeah. What is this doing? Yeah. Why do we need him to be able to see them versus not? I just, what? Are, what? Ugh. But by context of the way Thestrals work, and also I think people weren't all on their own individual Thestrals in the books. I think people paired up, and they tried to pair up people who couldn't see it with those who could. Can you imagine you are Ron Weasley? You're with everybody. Luna tells you, get on a Thestral. Luna, person that everyone thinks is wild and not sane. Mm -hmm. She says, go get on this Thestral. Ron says, there's nothing there. (laughs) And then you have to fly on your own Thestral, which you cannot see? That rules. It is bonkers to me. (laughs) And they just don't 
They don't show this in the movie at all. Not a discussion, nothing. They're just, yep, we're all flying out the Astros now, and we all have our own, and this is totally fine. Let's go to London. <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, you know, again, it's the thousand-foot perspective this movie has. It's like, and then they travel to London. By what means of transportation? The Death Horses. Next scene. <laughs> like, question answer. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and then they do that again because then they're just inside the fucking Ministry of Magic. Yeah. They don't have to do anything about getting in. There's no registration process, which happens in the books. They're just there. There's no security in, the, yeah, in this I definitely government wondered about office. That too. Yeah, I was like, what? It felt like just like a missed opportunity of like more drama, like and more, yeah. I don't know, just more stuff, right? Like it was just like, oh, they're just here now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did they get there? Like, wait, what is this place? This is the same if you could just stroll into the White House and everyone's like, yeah, you're in the Oval Office now. That's chill. It's after hours, so no one's here. <laughs> no, I need, I just, I just need a scene with like a grappling hook, right? Like in, that, in that scenario, right? It's like if you're breaking into the White House, like I just need to see one or two scenes of how that happened. It doesn't have to be super complicated, but just to go from not being in the White House to being in the White House, right? Or from not, you know what I mean? It just doesn't work. It doesn't it's, work. Al- right. it's also like the most top secret area of the Ministry of Magic. And they're like, and we're here. <sighs> yeah. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Bogus. And, and another fun thing is, Jikiva, the way they do this in the books is when you go with Arthur and you do the phone and you go to the register, like going through the visitor entrance, you have to state your name and why you are there. So it's like Harry Potter here for a trial. Mm-hmm. In the book, what they have to do when they get there is they put in their name and they ask who you are, and he says Harry Potter Rescue Mission, which is really cool. It's very cute. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. It's so cute. Cutting all this stuff just made time for all four montages. <laughs> yep, yep, that's true. All that's those true. valuable, valuable montages we needed to see. Yeah, <laughs> we needed them. So they get in. They're in the room with all the prophecies, and man, Jeremy Irons as Lucius Malfoy oh, yeah. gets better with every movie. <laughs> Wait, that was Jeremy Irons? Uh, or did no, I, is no, no, no. You're talking about Jason Isaacs. I Jason think. Isaacs. Oh, okay. That's who you're talking about. Jason Jeremy Isaacs. Irons voiced Scar, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Jason Isaacs as Lucius Malfoy gets better with every single movie. Mm-hmm. He's so fantastic. His hair gets better. His delivery gets better. <laughs> Every aspect of Jason Isaacs as Lucius Malfoy is, oh, it just keeps getting better. Yeah. I love it so much. He does a great job of just being a twat, like as an actor, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he's like, you are always just like, Ugh, like, <laughs> it's right there. And I, yeah, he does it so well. What is strange is when he first comes in, he's wearing the new Death Eater masks, where this is a David Yates choice, where now they're just wearing scary slash fancy Dia de las Muertas masks yeah. now instead of the pointy hoods from the previous film. They've got these on. And when he's first talking and he has the mask on, I, he has like voice modulation in the mask. That's yeah, Darth Vader thing going on in there. <laughs> yeah, it's slightly digitized voice until he removes his mask. <laughs> They, they, uh, they clearly had some really cool storyboarded images for this scene. And <laughs> this whole sequence is where they take so many liberties <laughs> that are very upsetting. So many. So, so many. But he comes in. He's all dramatic. The way he talks is just fantastic. And then Helena Bonham Carter comes in as Bellatrix. And let me say, Helena Bonham Carter's cheekbones? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. she's got They the are cheekbones. strong. Yeah. I want to know what cheek exercises she does because my goodness. It's called genetics. I get, I don't, her cheeks are swole. Like she has muscles in her cheeks. <laughs> does she chew ice or something? Oh. <laughs> Your love of Helena Bottom Carter's cheeks is just like amazing. Yeah. Well, you so know, fierce. when you lick stuff so much, you open your mouth all big, you get your true. cheeks yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. there. Yeah. That's the secret. You got to lick your Voldemort tattoo. <laughs> 
I mean, Daniel, you would appreciate this as a fan, or I think we're both now previous fans of The Bachelor. Do you remember Chad from that one season? Oh, boy, do I. I can't forget him. He used to chew ice to try to strengthen his cheekbone. No. Face muscles. <laughs> and I don't know if that works, but that's oh, what he that, would do. He would chew buckets of ice. I mean, he. it would make sense for him to be a Death Eater. So <laughs> oh, it would make sense yeah. that this would be common knowledge in their circles. A hundred percent. A million percent. Though that guy couldn't cast a scal- uh, spell to save his life. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that uh, Fenrir Greyback can either, but, you know, he's oh. there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Fenrir Greyback, the Chad of Harry Potter. Oh, we've done it. <laughs> oh, past Mike, you're just so silly. But you know what we need to do? We need to take a break because it's time for Wingardium Edredosa. Today's episode of Potter House is brought to you by Perfect Snacks. Let's say hypothetically that you are training with your friends in a secret classroom in your school, and it's a lot of work. You're there, a lot of hours, doing a lot of spells that are pretty hard. You're getting tired. You need to find a way to replenish your body in a tasty way and help build up all the muscles that you're burning with your intense wand movements. How are you going to do that? You're going to have a Perfect Bar from Perfect Snacks. Perfect Bar is the original refrigerated protein bar. Yes, it is refrigerated. Yes, I also thought that was weird, but now that I've eaten a bunch of them, I love it. They're delicious. Being refrigerated not only allows them to have a great taste and texture, but also it means they don't have to have chemical preservatives in them. And I don't particularly enjoy eating those, and neither should you. They're simply made with freshly ground nut butter and organic honey. They have up to 17 grams of whole food protein. They're made with 20 organic superfoods, and they have a cookie dough-like texture that is just as delicious as it is nutritious. I love the flavors that they sent me. One that I was very surprised by was coconut peanut butter. Didn't think I would like it. I do love it. They also have dark chocolate peanut butter, almond butter, seasonal ones like pumpkin pie, chocolate mint, you're going to find something that you love. Honestly, my favorite, though, is the classic chocolate chip. Gives you that nice, smooth peanut butter taste, but the little bit of chocolate sweetness is really nice after a workout or just as a snack. And don't let the fridge thing scare you. Just because they're in the fridge doesn't mean they can't be taken on the go, which is good for me because I'm about to travel right after recording this, and I'm going to throw a couple in my bag. So whether you're doing a long day of holiday shopping or that holiday 5K that you promised Grandpa Steve you were going to run, or if you're sitting in holiday traffic listening to Potterless in your car, Perfect Bars are good to go for up to a week out of the fridge. And also, Perfect Bars are gluten-free, soy-free, kosher, and low GI, so you're going to feel good inside, too. And if this sounds interesting, you're in luck, because Perfect Bar is offering 15% off your online order if you go to perfectbar.com slash potterless. Yes, you're right. The URL has changed. Shop refrigerated snacks at perfectbar.com slash potterless to get 15% off your order. They want you to be seasonally prepared. So go to perfectbar.com slash potterless, stock up, save 15%, and get ready for whatever you're doing in the holidays. Or if you're training in that room of requirement, with Harry for hours on end today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Skillshare. Let's say hypothetically that you are training with all of your friends in the secret classroom and you are trying to get better at these spells, but it's just not sticking. You're just not getting it. Maybe it's Harry's teaching style, but whatever it is, you need more. How are you going to develop these skills? You're going to use Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for your creators and they have over 25,000 classes that can fuel your curiosity, your creativity, and your career, or your wizarding school prowess. Skillshare classes are really great. I've enjoyed the ones that I've taken. They're very straightforward. They're very calming and relaxing too, which is nice. The sound quality is really good. The video is really good. It's always a very enjoyable experience when I do a Skillshare class. And I think you'll like it as well because they have classes in so many different things, whatever you're looking for, from social media marketing to mobile photography to creative writing, illustration, whatever you need, they've got it. And if you're interested, you are in luck. You can join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer for Potterless listeners. If you go to Skillshare.com slash Potterless, you will get two months of Skillshare for free. So that gets you unlimited access to over 25,000 classes for free. All you got to do is go to Skillshare.com slash Potteros, check out a class, see how you like it, start one, start a couple, get the vibe of it. And if you want to keep it afterwards, go for it. But if you want two free months to give it a shot, head on over to Skillshare.com slash Potterless, start looking up wand lessons and get better at Dumbledore's army stuff today. Finally, today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Acoustic Geometry. Let's say hypothetically that you are recording an ad read for your podcast in your bedroom before leaving for a trip to Canada with your fiance's family. Well, you gotta just do it in your room, and I don't know if you guys are listening to this, but there could be some noises in the background because I don't have panels from acoustic geometry in my bedroom. Remember last episode when the ad read sounded amazing and pristine and great? That's because I recorded in a room with acoustic geometry panels. Here in my bedroom, I do not have that, and that's why this sounds worse. The Multitudio has all of our panels from them, and it sounds so nice. They also look really professional, which is really great. 
We've had some important people come and guest on our shows. And when we have things that not only function well, but look nice, it's a better overall experience for our studio. So if you want to see the stuff that they offer, they have a lot of different things, not just podcast studio stuff, a lot of different options for things to take care of making something sound better or quieter or dissipate noise, whatever you need at acousticgeometry.com. We absolutely love the stuff that we have. Can't recommend them enough. Again, go to acousticgeometry.com and make whatever room you need to sound better, sound better today. We're getting to the worst part of the film. Yeah, we are. <gasps> like literally the worst part. And it involves Helena Bottom Carter. And it involves the most bangable member of this film. <laughs> <laughs> we will get there. But very quickly, this fifth movie keeps up the trend of every spell just sends people flying, which I don't know why the movies have decided to do this. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. They use Stupefy, and that sends people flying. Luna uses Levicorpus, which is supposed to float a body up. I get it, but it sends someone flying. Reducto sends things flying. Every spell just sends shit flying. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely was like, what does Stupefy do? Because I was like, it just seems like they th it throws people. But it I would think you. Stupefy would be like... You lose part of your brain or you get confused or something. It's a stunning spell. Yeah. It's supposed to stun you or... Then why don't you just say stun? Right. I, I always got the impression that it just kind of froze you. Like, I've been playing the Spider-Man PlayStation 4 video game, and mm -hmm. one of the things you have is you shoot someone with electric web, and they just kind of like... Da -da 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 in place. I always imagine it kind of did that. Mm. Not send people flying across the room. Yeah. Well, so this is the big fight scene. The kids are fighting the Death Eaters and holding their own. But, like, the spells, like you're saying, are effectively guns. <laughs> They're shooting Star Wars blasters that are different colors pew, pew. at each other. And it's not like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not why I'm here. I want to see some fun magic shit, which we eventually get once the big boys show up. Mm -hmm. But for this one, it's just, like, people hiding behind rocks, exchanging quips. And then they make the choice. That, this is the reason I was like, I want to do Harry Potter 5. <laughs> Everyone starts turning into smoke. <laughs> I knew yes, I was waiting uh, for you to mention that. Why? Uh, before we get into the smoke, I will okay. say the one spell that they do correctly that does not send someone flying is Neville uses Petrificus Totalis, which makes someone freeze up. That's the literal Latin translation. I took Latin in high school, mm. so I know this. But that one actually works, and that's nice. I was afraid that when I you hear Neville say Petrificus Totalis off screen, and then they cut to someone frozen in place, I was really afraid that in the spell that is inherently supposed to make someone just freeze and become stiff. When I was watching this, I was like, if this spell sends someone flying, I'm fucking turning off the movie. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many spells out there, and when it's spell duel time, they pick one of four, and I, like... Mm -hmm. It's, it's not fun to watch. No, it definitely not No, wasn't. it's not. But yes, the people flying and turning into smoke makes me so upset because, Jakiva, the big reveal about this that sucks is that in the books, they never talk about anyone flying. Flying just can't happen. Oh. And then in the seventh book, there's a part where Voldemort and the Death Eaters are chasing after Harry and all of the Order of the Phoenix members, and Voldemort is flying, and everybody freaks out out everyone loses their minds because Voldemort can fly yeah and that is such a powerful reveal in the book you're like what Voldemort can fly but if everybody's flying around in like smoke yeah. clouds exactly and it doesn't work yeah. exactly the books are so specific about how anyone gets anywhere and then all of a mm -hmm. sudden it's like well we got the bad guys turning into smoke going wherever they want the good guys turn into smoke too There's but it's white, white smoke because they're good guys <laughs> why is it color coded for what alignment you are right it's like it's very very much like the old like westerns, right? White hats were the good guys and the black hats were the bad guys. Yeah. It's very interesting because like LOTR, Lord of the Rings, like, dude, those things went on for like three and a half hours worth of stuff. And I get it. Like this is it has to be more all ages. But there's just so many things I'm like, well, if you just would have made the movie twenty minutes longer you probably could have covered a lot of like these issues that Mike has. Yeah. I don't know about Seamus's tie. I don't know if we could have corrected that. <laughs> 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 Seamus's shame tie. <laughs> but yeah, just some of the small stuff, yeah. Yeah, what it always comes down to, I appreciated that this one was only two hours and 20 minutes instead of two hours and 40 minutes like the previous ones leading up to this. And I've said this in almost every movie episode of Potters is just, 
what they decide to spend time on versus what they decide to not spend time on is bonkers. And I think they do a lot of things right in this one. The fifth book is so long mm-hmm. and they cut out a lot of things that don't matter. The cleaning scenes, not that important. The St. Mungo's hospital trips, not that important. So I think they do a good job there. But I don't understand why this fight scene and everything in the Department of Mysteries, it's so interesting. It's the most interesting part of the book. Yeah. And it's not the longest parts of the movie. There's so much for all the other stuff. I was just listening to your episode about this and leading up to this fight scene, they're going through all these different crazy rooms. It's like a dungeon crawl thing. The brain room. There's no brain room. Just keep in the books. There's a room that just has these giant brains in this big vat of green liquid and the spinal cords attack Ron. Oh, oh that's gross, but kind of awesome. Wait, right? Why do they attack Ron? Oh, Wait, well, allow me, allow, allow me to quote past Mike here. Oh, Oh, Ron gets a like you're drunk now spell cast on him sees all the brains he's like these brains kick ass Accio brain which is summons the brain and then tentacles grow out of it after he summons it towards oh. himself but also as I think your guest was Julia on that episode is she so. very smartly pointed out all the rooms that they go through are like the mysteries that the magic world cannot solve right and so there's a time room there's a thought room and then the arch thing that's the death room these are like things that wizards don't have the answers to and so like that makes the arch much more interesting than rather like your friend fell in the hole i don't know where he went (laughs) yeah and you you lose out on something that i wanted to see in the movie so badly which is the fight between the kids and the death eaters is way more drawn out they run to all the separate rooms they get separated they find each other again there's all this other stuff but there's one part in particular in the time room where one of the death eaters gets his head stuck in this glass case of sorts where something is constantly going through time and he becomes a full grown man with a baby head <laughs> and not putting that in the film is a crime what? a travesty and so David like Yates should be juice, arrested like the end of yes. Beetlejuice <laughs> He's a full-grown man with a baby head, and oh. But then he also acts like a baby. I don't get how that didn't make it. (laughs) Yeah, he becomes stupid. Yeah. Like babies are stupid. (laughs) I just, how do you read the book, and that's in there, and then you go, nah. I think they're like, (laughs) we got $2 million, and we are going to computer animate a room full of glass balls. That's it. Right. I read a quote being like, if we had built a live set for the glass ball rooms, setting all those glass balls up again would have taken weeks. I'm like, well. You didn't need to do it. That wasn't in the book. (laughs) Yeah. It didn't talk about that many glass balls getting broken. There's a couple times where they knock them over on the Death Eaters and stuff like that, but at no point in the book did they say, every prophecy gets destroyed. And there's a big glass ball avalanche and the kids have to run away from it. Yeah. What? what? (laughs) The books have these awesome duels described and they go na 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 run away from glass <laughs> <laughs> also okay maybe i'm dumb i'm confused as to this whole macguffin situation here everyone wants a prophecy which is a glass ball <laughs> Why? Why specifically they want Harry's? Yeah. Yeah, They so they don't explain this in the movie at all. But in the book, they explain that the prophecy was something that Trelawney revealed to Dumbledore. And this is also why Trelawney is still a professor at Hogwarts is because she does prophecies from time to time. She needs to be protected as well because someone, and you later learn it's Snape, I think, heard part of this prophecy to Dumbledore until they kick this person out of the room. And then Snape tells, yeah, definitely Snape. Snape tells that prophecy to Voldemort, but he only knows the first part of it. And then that's what kicks Voldemort into action to attack Harry because he knows part of it. He knows about the baby being born and Mm -hmm. he knows that he's only heard part of the prophecy. So his whole reason for finding this prophecy is so that he can hear the rest of it and know what's happening. And all of that aspect of it is not in the movie, which seems important when the key (laughs) plot point just isn't explained. Yeah, The orb and the prophecy is the center, it's the hinge of the book, and they don't explain it in its entirety? Isn't there some rule like only the people in the prophecy can pick it up again or something? Yes, only people in the prophecy can pick it up, but then once it's picked up, Anyone can get it, which seems like a broken system. Mm -hmm. But 
they also changed the way that was done. Harry's kind of tricked into picking it up and all the Death Eaters laugh at him for doing it and all. The, I don't know. They just, this is where I, I really all it's just, they mess up everything. And I just got mad. I got angry watching this. Yeah. Cause they just, uh, the end of the fifth book's really good. Okay, I remember watching this in theaters forever ago and feeling like, I feel like an idiot watching this. Cause I have no idea what anyone wants here. Like I must've not been paying attention. Mm-hmm. And I think the answer is they just never told nope. No, us. I legit fell that way when I was watching this movie earlier today. And yeah. I was like, um, Wait a minute. Yeah. Am I missing something? Mm-hmm. And it's nice to know that even somebody who's read the books feels that way. So it's like, maybe I just would have gotten more out of this if I read the books. But apparently, no, no that's not the case. So I want to talk about the bad part. Okay, the bad part. Yes. You get into the room. I have a couple notes about just, I hated that the Death Eaters fly. Who's the one flying guy that's flying next to Harry? I don't understand mm-hmm. this. Oh, yeah, I don't know who that but is. But then we get into the room with the archway. And... That's fine. It looks cool. They're true to form with Harry and Luna hearing the whispering, the other people not hearing the whispering. Again, this is a if you've witnessed death thing because the veil is death. But they ruin the scene because there's nothing where it does not happen where Harry hands over the orb and then Sirius comes in and goes, step away from my godson Mm -hmm. and then pauses for a beat before punching Lucius in the face. That is not how that would have worked. (laughs) It's not how it happened in the book. People would have shot spells. How did no one see Sirius just stroll up to Lucius? Mm -hmm. Ah, just... I do love it when it's like, we're having a wizard's fight and someone just like kicks or punches someone. (laughs) Just breaking up the karate (laughs) chop. (laughs) It happens a couple times in the book series and it's fun when that happens, but this is not the time for it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, then there's the fight. All the people come in. They white apparate, which is bullshit. Just, oh, we're nice. So we're white smoke mm-hmm. flying people. And then there's the fighting scene. I do really enjoy one thing that they add in the movie here, which is when Sirius is going at Lucius with Harry and Harry does a spell. And then Sirius says, nice one, James. Oh, yeah. That is not in the book. And that's incredible. That is so good that they've added that. I love it a lot. Real heartstring tugger there. Yeah. But then you get what Jakiva's been wanting to talk about. No, I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) You said you wanted to get to it. I know, but now that we're here, I don't think I want to talk about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about how they did it in the book because the way they did it in the book is better. I agree. (laughs) If by better, do you mean crueler? Because I don't like it. Uh, It's yeah, it's just different. We'll see. You've got Bellatrix has been dueling with Tonks a bunch in this scene. And then eventually Sirius comes in to help. And I believe Bellatrix shoots a spell at Sirius and he dodges it. And then he starts laughing at her for missing. And then Bellatrix hits him with a stunning spell, which sends him flying off of an elevated perch and then he falls down through the veil while he's still alive goes through the veil and then it just becomes more confusing about what has actually happened yeah because harry's like well i'm gonna go in there after him and then lupin has to say no 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 no, he's dead Mm -hmm. and then harry goes no i heard voices on the other side he just teleported blah blah lupin's like no dude He's dead. And it makes the death more crushing when you're reading it because it is so sudden. Everything about it is so sudden. And the way it dies, you don't know what this arch in the veil is. You're so confused. And by making it actually Avada Kedavra in the movie, and then he just gets sucked away by the veil because he's dead now? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, it was so sad though, because it's so sudden. I mean, the suddenness was there, but yeah, he's, like, he's holding on, and then he just there's no chance to say goodbye. And I don't know, it's just it was it was like the moment I was like, no, like <laughs> all that sexiness wasted. I know all that that bangable, bangable man. But it's all undermined by him getting murdered before then going into the death zone. <laughs> But yeah, I just, I didn't like how they did this. I didn't like the whole fight was done differently here because there's not as much back and forth with people fighting. All the kids get put at one point really early on. You don't get the thing where the way the prophecy actually breaks is that Neville has it and he's trying to leave with it and then someone hits him with a jelly leg spell and then he drops it. Mm -hmm. It's way more fun. They just, 
really botched the whole end of this. So yeah. Sirius is dead. Is he dead forever? Oh yeah, he's g- g- gone. No, but the way <laughs> God damn it. they really tug on the heartstrings here because. The directorial choice to silence everything and then just show Harry screaming but no sound coming out. Oh, oh. It's good, oh. but didn't that feel like out of place for that movie? I don't know. It's like that whole thing is something you see in like, I don't know, a Saving Private Ryan mm. kind of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harry's temporarily deafened by a grenade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it did seem out of place, but I still really liked it. I thought it was good. I, I thought it was too. cool. I couldn't hear it over the unbelievably sa- a loud sound of my arms crossing in frustration. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they shouldn't have killed him before he fell back through the portal or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Then you've got Harry chasing after Bellatrix. And again, they've botched this because Harry does Crucio and it actually works on knocking her over. And then Voldemort steps in and says you have to really mean it and all of that. Mm -hmm. The way that it happened in the book is that he's chasing after Bellatrix. He tries Crucio. It doesn't really work. And then Bellatrix makes fun of Harry saying, oh, come on, you've got to mean it. You clearly didn't mean it. And it's more cruel because Bellatrix is already killed Sirius and then is now saying Harry isn't upset enough Mm. about the death to really make the spell work. But then... You've got a little back and forth between Bellatrix and Harry, and then Bellatrix starts freaking out, calling to Voldemort because they've messed up the plan, the prophecy's been broken, that was the whole thing, and she's worried. And then Harry, this is one of my favorite lines in the book, and this is something that has become a running joke on the show, Mm -hmm. Harry says, why are you yelling to him, Voldemort can't hear you? And then Voldemort enters by saying, Can't I, Potter? <laughs> yes, Which I is do remember that. <laughs> why best. does your why does your Voldemort sound like a whimsical British lady? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what Voldemort like is. A very deep down. excited Mary Poppins. It sounds like if Mary Poppins like drank three Red Bulls. <laughs> 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 Can't I, Voldemort? Oh. Uh, but Voldemort, this line is the best line in the entire series because you've got Voldemort doing the 80s action movie trope on entering on a dramatic line. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, gosh. It makes me so upset yeah. that they did not include Can't I, Potter. <laughs> <laughs> I needed it. I needed it. You are so nitpicky. I feel like... This is not nitpicky. This is essential to Potterless. No, okay. So here's the whole thing. I feel like I would love and hate watching a movie with you. (laughs) I don't do this for regular movies. It's just when I'm watching this movie for my Harry Potter comedy podcast. Oh, okay. Because I'm just like, if you were like this. (laughs) Oh, no, 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 no. Like in any movie. I mean, so much of it is just because it's changing stuff from the book. So much of this is just, yeah, the movie's fine. But then all of my complaints are that the book did it better. It's not that it was necessarily bad in the movie, so... Yeah, I'll, you know, I think I'm with Mike here. <laughs> yeah, just because I like to imagine a world where, like, what if in the movies Voldemort was kind of fun? Yeah, got why people wanted to be around him and stuff, and like he, oh, I, I love to hate him and I hate to love him. Sure, stuff like that. He's one for the theatrics, and this removes one of his best theatrical moments. Yeah, I guess you're right, but I'm just thinking, like, of all the things, like <laughs> that you've listed tonight, <laughs> just the hits keep coming like oh his tie's too short like, why is she crying in this too much scene? candle wax <laughs> yeah too much candle wax but, uh, <laughs> but can't i potter is so good like it's so bad but it's so good i'm sorry, I'm sorry it's how, the how, most... does, how does voldemort say it again he says it uh, just a little bit like can't i potter <laughs> <laughs> A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. <laughs> uh, but it makes me very upset. Can we talk about the good wizard fight? <laughs> oh, I think they also fucked this one up too. Oh, really? Yeah, the Voldemort versus Dumbledore thing is one of my favorite scenes in the entire series in the book. And they just, I don't know. There's there's some cooler stuff that goes down. First off, they do the 
spell meeting Priorian cantatim esque thing where you've got the spells hitting and the sparks kind of flying out of it, or whatever. Can, uh, does that whole sparks hitting thing? I thought that was specifically a Harry Potter Voldemort thing because they got the, yes. the, the yes. brother wands or whatever. Yes, it is. So by doing this in the movie, it's dumb and it discredits. That. Okay, good. The other I thing was that right. they ruin is that when Dumbledore enters the fray. He's incredibly calm the entire time. This is the first time we see Dumbledore fight anybody. And it's supposed to be that Dumbledore is very calm and Voldemort is kind of on the defensive of sorts. Mm. In the movie, they flipped it where Voldemort seems very confident and Dumbledore seems like he's struggling. But also what happens is in the fight, Dumbledore goes in and there's this statue in the middle of the Ministry of Magic with a wizard and a centaur and something else. And he transfigures all of them and uses them to fight Voldemort and defend himself. And it's really cool. And they just decide, nah, this is too fun. And they just don't do it. It's funny because the rest of the fight is like verbatim from the books. Like the (laughs) non-summoned elemental statue thing is like, and then he makes the rope into a snake and then makes the water ball and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. All the same. The rest of it is done true to form, which is solid. But I think what really upsets me is just that you lose, I think, such an important element of reading it in the book is that Dumbledore seems so confident Mm -hmm. and he's doing all nonverbal spells and he's just tossing aside things that Voldemort throw at him. And you get to see Harry freak out thinking, oh my gosh, I'm watching Dumbledore fight. I've never seen him do this before. And he's just a master at it. And this whole fight against Voldemort, it feels like Voldemort's winning the whole time and Dumbledore's just surviving. And that's not the vibe that I got from the book at all. Mm. I was just excited that we're having a wizard fight and they're actually doing wizarding things and not just shooting laser blasters at each other. Yeah. I do think it was cool when they were doing things like using the other hand and Voldemort uses the breath to make the fire snake. I did think that was a kind of fun wizarding thing. It's more yeah. than just the wands. You're getting other hands in the mix. <laughs> Ooh, two hands. We're dual wielding. <laughs> little Kamehameha action yeah. coming here. Ooh. <laughs> and then I don't know if I don't know if the CGI firm they hired just loved doing broken glass, but at one point in the fight, Voldemort does this scream where he screams and then breaks all of the glass in the entire (laughs) Ministry of Magic at once. Mm -hmm. And then this is something that just has always bothered me. This bothered me when I read the books and when I watched the movie. This is all taking place in the Ministry of Magic, and it's late at night, I guess, so not a lot of people are there. But how is there not a single soul in the Ministry of Magic that walks down while this is happening? If you've ever been at an office, you're working on something late, you're like, all right, it's 9 o'clock, but I finally finished those reports. Go down the elevator into the lobby, and then you see Voldemort and Dumbledore fighting. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this happened off screen, but like, you know, the intern staying late came down in the elevator. The door's open. He says, going up. <laughs> the door close button goes right back up. <laughs> I just don't understand how not a single person there yeah. or how they've like no security system to know, hey, Voldemort's here and no one shows up. Well, this is the price you pay when you have like a magic broom doing all the dusting and mm-hmm. letters like screaming at people. You don't have any staff that are there after hours it's all just enchanted right. bullshit yep, 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 yep. Oh, well, you could just have like i don't know you could have some kind of magical thing yeah you know what i mean like a simply safe home alarm system <laughs> hey they have not sponsored the podcast yet so don't yeah we're not don't give, give them credit we're not giving them any money no but i just mean like if hermione could put like this in the book if hermione can put the spell on like the people who find the room right then it's like there's got to be some like high security guard wizard <gasps> Ooh. Ooh, that would be an interesting thing to think about. Like, who are the lay people in the wizarding universe? Uh. Oh, squibs. <laughs> <laughs> Not even squibs, but like they're actual like oh. wizards. But like their whole thing is like, oh, I just like guard. I make the that. Ministry of Magic. <laughs> I silk screen t shirts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Using magic. Sorry to all my screen printers out there. <laughs> I just think that would be funny to think about. That's going in our show. <laughs> so then we have the scene where Voldemort ends up possessing Harry and being inside his head and we get some Harry Voldemort mind fuck situations. I hated this. Yeah, it's bonkers. And again, I was laughing the whole time. It's not scary. We get some really funny ones. We get one where Harry is looking in the mirror and his head turns into Voldemort's head, Mm -hmm. which is very funny. And then we get one, if you're watching at home, folks, at two hours, one minute and 49 seconds where Dumbledore is trying to say, Harry, it's not what makes you the same. 
It's what makes you different that separates you. No, you got to say it like he says it. <laughs> it's not what makes you the same. <laughs> it's what makes you different. But then it's showing Harry and he's like writhing around like a snake. And then it cuts to just a 0.5 second clip of Voldemort going, <laughs> do you know the thing I'm talking about? <laughs> no. I know what you're talking oh, okay. about. It's the funniest. I am pulling up the video okay. and I'm going <laughs> to. It's the funniest shit <laughs> I've seen in a long time. I found it on YouTube. It just so perfectly had the thumbnail. Oh, it, it, it has just the Voldemort. Tsa. Yeah. This is Harry Potter possession. It looks like he's in the cast of cats. Or <laughs> yeah. Okay. Harry's screaming. Oh, there it is. <laughs> It's very good. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to, just so I can get it on the microphone, I'm going to turn the volume all the way to my headphones and then hit play. (laughs) 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 I got to keep rewinding it, Daniel. We got to see it a few more times. Oh, are there more of these? No, I mean, he only does the once, but oh my God, it's so funny. Yeah. It looks like Voldemort has cut like a promo for his like amateur magician act. <laughs> There's like bad effects in the background, but uh, tss- <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> oh, he says it so quietly. That's the best part. <laughs> uh, Voldemort, what did you think of uh, that wine I served you earlier? <laughs> oh, come on, come on. <laughs> That's Voldemort. Rude. That's rude. Who's, Voldemort. <laughs> Voldemort. Who's, who, who's your favorite R and B artist? Tsa. And that's a S Z A. And I'm assuming that's how you pronounce her name. Yes. Tsa. Voldemort. It, it's time to give your live book report on Catcher in the Rye. Him. C minus. <laughs> Podcasters out there and Mike Schubert, you can't see Daniel's face when he <laughs> <made> it. <laughs> but it's, so, it's just it's, like Voldemort. Uh, it hurts. It hurts my tum tum. <laughs> <sighs> so yeah, everybody, go home, watch the sa. It's the best. I'll be posting this all over my social media everywhere. Yeah, Harry <laughs> Potter hyphen funniest. possession hyphen HD. It's on YouTube. Okay, wonderful. Good, 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 good. Okay, so yeah, I I absolutely hated like the, like Harry Potter's whole like reason. Like it's not what makes you the same; it's what makes you different. And he like, gives that whole speech like I pity you. You'll never have friends. And it's oh, like, yeah. what is this like lame ass shit? At least I have friends. It's the power nerd. of love. <laughs> yeah. It's the power of love. Just like Huey Lewis in the news wanted us to no. know. No, no, boo the power of love. Yeah. I mean, like, as a way of, like, defeating all enemies. It's like, no. Not the hit song from the 1985 film, Back to the Future. (laughs) Now, see, that could really save Hogwarts. (laughs) No, I just, I don't know, I just felt, like, so contrived. And I was like, I feel like I wasted two hours, and then at that point, like, eight minutes of like my life watching for this big reveal at the end. Oh, yeah. I was like, what is this? But what? sometimes you go to the uh, the movie theater, which in my metaphor is like a Froyo place. And they're like, what flavor would you like? And you're like, I'll have plain. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have uh, the lemon hey, or vanilla moral I or whatever. I like the plain frozen yogurt. <laughs> it's have... tart and delicious. That's right. And sometimes you just need something tart and delicious and familiar. Love. Uh, but that was like too too tart and just blech. Yeah. Blech, 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 blech. That was also like from 2001 Seven. to 2012. It was basically the moral of everything was like, you may be defeated, but you can always have hope. <laughs> Love is the answer to everything. <laughs> what creepy elf is this? I write screenplays in Hollywood. <laughs> Tell me, what are your troubles? Um, uh, well, mister. Have you tried, love? <laughs> sometimes I just wake up in the middle of the night thinking that, well, maybe I won't really be successful or have any friends. Well, you're loved and have friends. Goodbye. <laughs> sometimes in the middle of the night, I wake up and think, <laughs> 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 ah, At last, my nemesis cannot be defeated. <laughs> Not even love. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So, anyway... 
You got the whole scene where Fudge comes in, sees them, Voldemort leaves, Bellatrix <laughs> leaves. Also, everyone just shows up. Are they just like there for work in the morning? What? Yeah, what? <laughs> what How are do you we... suddenly there? I, I forget what happens. Oh, Dumbledore says that the Aurors have been alerted when he finally walks in to start fighting. Oh, okay. So it just takes them, I guess, a really long time to apparate or flu network in you got to put on your robe and wizard hat i yeah, guess they're actually yeah. just picking out right outfits that's yeah. the whole thing that they were doing yeah we need people showing up with like curlers still in their hair i don't want to look bad in front of voldemort i don't what? want him to think i look gross i want to dress to impress yeah. and then just suddenly he's like oh he's real like yeah fucking dude he is real like <laughs> you should have listened you could have saved everybody this whole movie mm-hmm so you then get the scene of Harry and Dumbledore talking and Dumbledore does this reveal of why he was so distant all year and why his plan failed and all of this. Unfortunately, they cut straight to this. And in the book, you have a scene of Harry just breaking all of the shit in Dumbledore's office for an oh, hour. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, oh, he just is getting out his anger about the serious black death. And he just destroys everything in Dumbledore's office and Dumbledore just lets him. And then Dumbledore talks to him about it after Harry's got all his aggression out. And they didn't have this. And I wanted to see Daniel Radcliffe breaking a million things. I feel like they're like, that would be too scary for Harry Potter to do. It would No one would come see the sixth movie because they'd bring their children to the cinema and be like, why was the hero breaking Dumbledore's hourglass or whatever? <laughs> no, dude. I don't know. Like those Dementors in the beginning were legit scary for yeah. like an eight-year-old. But they're bad guys. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could throw stones at them. I'm just saying, like, that's a real emotion. Maybe people would be healthier emotionally if we had more. Oh, God. Too I'm scary. Trying, and I'm trying oh. to sound like every millennial that I hate. Oh. But... <laughs> Perhaps if we had more real portrayals of emotion in movies, <laughs> maybe, we would be less weird. Or maybe if we just believed in the power of friendship. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe... <t> <laughs> That's a third option. <laughs> <laughs> they do the classic like well we're all in the hospital time to explain what actually happened in the movie yeah. except in this case right. not really <laughs> yeah so they kind of explain it but not super in depth and then you leave that scene and they have something that they've completely removed from the book which is a scene between Harry and nearly headless Nick about death and I think this explains why they did killing Sirius with Avada Kedavra because they have removed a lot of the confusion of is Sirius dead, I'm confused, what's happening, all of this. And then also there's no thing of Harry getting the gift from Sirius with the mirror and then also mm. with the blade from Sirius. Those are just not here. Yeah. He gets these gifts to keep it from Sirius. One, it's like a mirror where you can always see where Sirius is through the mirror and then a blade that can open any door. And when Harry gets back to his room after this, he tries to use the mirror, which I don't know if he broke out of anger. Did he smash it out of anger or did he he like tries to use the mirror and then it doesn't work to see Sirius. So he breaks it out of anger and then he's got a fragment of it in the later movies. He sees an eyeball in it. Mm -hmm, that's later on. Wait, does that mean he's alive? No, I'm sorry. no he's dead. Sirius is super brother. duper dead. He's very, very, very dead. <laughs> Then Harry has this whole conversation with Nearly Headless Nick, one of the ghosts at Hogwarts, about death and what it means. And it's actually strangely profound for a character that was kind of goofy throughout the books, which I think is fun. And then Harry has a conversation with Luna, which the contents of which that was that thing I talked about. They put this way earlier on where Luna talks about some of the stuff she's gone through with death, like her mother passing away at age, when Luna was at age nine, all this other stuff. But they've just decided, all right, the fight scene's over, so the movie's got to end. So they just go, and they get on the train, and Harry's wearing a blazer. When did Harry get a blazer? He's been wearing T-shirts and zip-up hoodies all movie. Yeah, right? But now he's fancy, and... That's it. You don't get Ginny having a thing with Michael Corner, which is a fun part of the end of the book, too. Mm. Or she's with Michael Corner, and then she gets with Dean Thomas by wait, the end wait, of book wait, five. Wait, 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 wait. What, what kind of thing you talking about? Just like normal high school dating kind of stuff. But yeah. it's oh, okay. something that sets up in book five is, oh, wow, Ginny's like starting to see some people. Yeah, she's I saw Ginny out. the other Just day. She's being a hoe. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I saw Ginny and Michael. He had his entire mouth over her. <laughs> 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 Like, what is that? A first kiss. No, it was, it was a face vacuum. When two people love each other very much. Mm -hmm. One of them sucks the other person's face off. <laughs> but yeah, and then they get on the train and go home and the movie zooms out dramatically and then it's 
the end of the movie, yeah. directed by David Yates. In- yes, okay, so a couple things. First of all, I was not a fan of just like the like vindication of like Harry through like the newspaper clippings. Oh yeah, where it was like Voldemort and Harry are right, and I was like, this is so. Lame. A lot of exposition done through various newspapers in this mm-hmm. movie, yeah. an alarmingly high amount. Yeah. Uh- <laughs> Also, like, greatly simplifies, you know, truth in media. (laughs) It's like, well, if people find out the truth, then they'll just actually report it. But what's weird is because the whole setup is that the Daily Prophet has been stretching the truth and lying. But then, as a legitimate narrator source in the movie, they go, well, now the Daily Prophet tells the truth now. (laughs) Yeah. like, yeah, because I'm going to believe that. And then, okay, so then also during the credit sequence, another thing. Did anybody else feel like the song was stupid and like didn't really work with like the movie it was too happy Mm. yeah it was too happy it was weird like it didn't feel whimsical or like adventurous which is like what harry potter is it just felt like a normal happy rinky-dink song i don't know i just i was not a fan of this at the end i was like huh this doesn't feel like harry potter at all no it didn't feel like it came off of the harry potter soundtrack and i guess they were trying to ride the ending where harry goes arm in arm with Ron and Hermione and says, well, you know, at least we have friends and each other and it's going to be okay. And then they play this music. But you're right. It was very, I don't know. It didn't sound particularly Harry Potter-esque. And it was upbeat, but not whimsical. I agree. I think you put it, you put it very nicely. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, all the names were in that lovely pink and black text. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Well, there you go. Movie number five. Bam. Yep, we did it. Yeah, boom. Any final thoughts from Daniel and Jakiva? Uh, We dunked on this movie a lot. I don't think people like this one, though, so I think we'll be okay. I think most people are upset by this movie. I, gosh, because there's parts of it that, like, are good. There's, yeah, the hanging out parts. It started off well. Yeah. Yeah, it actually did start off super strong. And Umbridge is amazing. Yeah, and also the freaky, weird, not normal tone it starts with at the beginning of just like some British kids bullying each other in a field or in a playground like that's not how these movies start it's normally like fun magic music as you see an owl fly around this is very starkly shot and then the rest of it just is so mechanical it's Mm -hmm. hard to enjoy But that being said, I do think that there were some lovely tiny gems in there. Yes. And so, like, looking at this movie is kind of like looking at the cosmos when you live in a city. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't really... Whoa. Yeah, yeah. You like this shit? I'm about to bring it home real deep. All right? Do it. (laughs) Do it. (laughs) Do it. Uh, You can't see everything. And in fact, like, a lot of the things have been blotted out for various reasons. But... You can see some of the things out there and the parts that you can see are beautiful and they Mm. remind you of magic and they remind you of love. 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 (laughs) And they remind you of the beauty that is the Harry Potter universe. Mmm. Beautiful. Amazing. Wow. You've done it. I can't put a better bow on that. I'm just mad that they didn't put Can't I Potter in. My yeah. favorite line. How could they do this to me? <laughs> Unforgivable. Can't I Potter? Unforgivable. <laughs> hey, but, but Mike, they did give you. <laughs> That's right. Oh, damn, yeah. For yeah. what they lack in Can't I Potter, they make up for in yeah. Can we make that the subtitle of this episode? <laughs> like beautiful Fox the Phoenix, what emerges from the flames of one great <laughs> quote comes another. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I think that's what I'm just gonna need to cheer myself up is just make a YouTube cut of just the tsa over and over and oh, over yeah. and over. <laughs> There's so many of those videos on YouTube that's like this thing, Nyan Cat for twelve hours. Give me ten hours of tsa. Oh. <laughs> Do you really want 10 hours of it or just like no, one No, I want 20. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give me the maximum amount. But it gets slightly faster each time. So then oh. at the end it's just <laughs> 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 That's from Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> <laughs> I hit it with a nice Chianti. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can tell, this movie is really taking it out of us. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, 1.30 in the morning here. Oops. Yay, West Coast guests. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Woo-hoo. 
Well, thank you, Mike, for having us on your podcast. Yeah, it thank was you. Thank you for a joining. Blast. I had a lot of fun. This was so good. I'm very glad I could have both of you on. Oh. I knew that I wanted to have you on at some point, and I'm glad we could finally make it happen. This was a long time coming, and it yeah. warms my heart. So thanks for having us. Glad you could be on the show. Yeah, for sure. If people want to find you, where can they go? Okay, go listen to a podcast I do. It's called Third Act Saviors. It's me and my pals watching bad movies like this one and chatting about mm-hmm. them. And also, we try and fix the end by pitching new endings to fix them. We're bad at it, but we still do it. I don't know. The way that I fixed the Santa Claus was incredibly profound. I thought I fixed that film. Ooh, and, I have to listen to that That's one. right. In order to find out how Mike would fix the perfect film, the Santa Claus, where a man <laughs> is forcibly turned into Santa Claus, <laughs> <laughs> listen to the episode. Follow me on Twitter at Daniel RK underscore, and maybe I'll start posting. <laughs> yes. I'm Jakiva Phillips. You can find me on Facebook. You can learn about all of the fun, interesting things that I'm doing. Also, you want to follow me in my business, Word Lit Zine, which is a quarterly magazine where I interview local poets and writers. There are puzzles and games. We share amazing fiction and poetry from the Pacific Northwest region. There's also an adjacent television show based off of that called Z Sides. So if you are interested in knowing more about that and you can't get enough, you can find me at Word Lit Zine on Instagram. Sweet. Well, again, thanks so much for being on. Listeners, thank you for listening. And as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, after they say, Tsa! <laughs> Wizard on! <Wizarding> on! <laughs> Hey, if you're going to be traveling a bunch over the holidays and you want to stock up on Potterless stuff to listen to, but you're already caught up on all the episodes and you need more audio in your life, head on over to Patreon. There are hours upon hours of content. Once you sign up for Patreon, you can get access to all of the audio content, depending on what tier you get, but you get the entire backlog, tons of bonus episodes, tons of director's commentary. Check them all out and binge listen to all of them while you're on a plane, a train, or an automobile this holiday season. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert, as well as Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horton. Natalie Klobuchar, Char Klauser, Lopu, Frank, Chiodo, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfelio, Abita Med, Rose, Maria Dodge, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivet, and Eric, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Rossanne Batamana, Nikita Power, Ali Madsen, Amelia Krauss, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orca Gor, Vivian the Owl, Takari Ront, Haley Hastings, Moster, Anganad Stodder, Alex Consilver, John Cocker, Noel Basilate, Emily Tyrell, Liz Bigelow, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Enslin, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillen, Veronica Vartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Mark, Lou Friday, Jay Svetson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Summer Rathel, Heather Fleischman, Vera Cullitham, Carrie D. Bagason, Andrea Crock, Lisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Cameron Watkins, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Toothless Walnut, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Neda Atabani, Remy Fontaine, Sarah Shecker, Nona VM, Zina Rosanowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia Addy, Brian, Jenny Campion, Nikki Harris, Cara Hamilton, Courtney Hemwood, Kine, Amanda Alfred, Sabrina, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Lindy Plackey, Martha Madueno, Benjamin Desmond, Sarah Shetter, Marta Morrison, Stephanie Magnuson, Justine Wade, Aaron Richter, CJ Ochoco, Eileen Gazesh, Violet Sullivan, Kat Yowl, Lindsay Towning, Fielding Lee, Keegan Curran, Miranda Manning, Gail Ann, Mr. Folk, Adam Bryant, Christine Welton, Maya, Zachary Davis, Kieran, Heaven, Christy, Lily Lee, Peter Williams, Wire Warrior 4976, Floor Sake, Sierra Skiaris Ford, Georgia, Itzel Ime Ayala, Peter Wyckoff, Candy Kane, Skyla Lily, Ed O'Ryan, Professor Threat, Kelsey Lesian, Ellie Huskovchova, Lubin Maleo, Akinwande, Lena Karen, Daniel Fulkerson, Lee Lili, Elizabeth Christofferson, Abby, Luca Faccio, Michael David Yordi, Nice Ear Muffs Potter, Did Your Mum Make Them For You? Cara Hoyer, Tiffany Cottrell, Kelly Otilio, Nadia Vansgard, Kerry Crumpler, Jamie Kingston, Camilo Garcia, Connie Bienkowski, Mary Mateel, Jennifer Went, Anastasia Blake, Jaden Allman, Nedry OS, Matt Barger, Riley Lane, Will Husser, Zephyr Lawrence, Brett Clausen, Samantha Lentz, Kayla M. Simino, Lauren Wainwright, Aurora Fruhoff, Emma Clark, Hermione Snape, Megan Dick, Out of Context 69, Liam McCormick, Melena Brandle, Marco Cepeda, Ella Robertson, Hannah Zeters, Cordy Spilker, Victoria McCormick, Marie Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, Julie Walton, The Meadows Family, Jennifer From the Block, Anna Penalber Alvarez, Fake Valentine, Brianna Jordan, Karu Teru, Sarah Saunders, McKenna Tweedy, Six Awkward Nine, Anthony Ruiz, Peter Mina, Heather Langeal, Weekend of Dead Cat Ladies, Javi Guadalupe Trejo III, Darlene Kerr, Brad Harding, Thomas Chavara, Charlotte, Brianna Cusimano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Patrick Cribben, Chris U2, Alex Romano, Bugaboo, Charles Ivan, Haley Logan, Adam Graham, Emma Ashley Enstrom, Peter McGrath, Sophie Duda, Jack McMahon, Jen and Rose Daub, T Pixel Guy, Nicole Linzer, Out of Context 69, Callahan and Darius, Kylo the Husky, Leah Reed, Melissa Robb, Jordy Wright, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Bill Gill, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can at Facebook.com slash Potterless, Twitter.com slash Potterless Pod, Instagram.com slash Potterless Podcast, or Reddit.com slash R slash Potterless. For all information about the show, you can go to PotterlessPodcast.com. For bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. And for merch, you can go to bit.ly slash merch on. If you want to tell someone about the show, whether it's in person or online through a review, that really helps. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on.